Welcome to a bank holiday edition of Tisky Sour. We're talking tonight about the Labour Party becoming a Tony Blair reenactment society. We're giving you a rundown of all the really horrific bills that passed into law last week. And we're going to give you an introduction to the history of International Workers' Day. I'm joined by Barnaby Rain. How are you doing, Barnaby? It is a delight to be here, Michael. There's nowhere I'd rather be on a bank holiday Monday than uh, here with you. Such a pleasure to have you, Barnaby. It's the May Day bank holiday. This weekend saw International Workers' Day take place at a time when the very cost of staying alive has outstripped what many of us are paid. It couldn't mean more than it does today. Bills have skyrocketed, the price of basic goods grows and grows, and most of us will have felt a deep hit to our pay packets just this month. Solidarity, action, disruption and withdrawing your labour have always mattered, but now they feel newly urgent. And around the world this weekend, workers have taken to the streets to protest the excessive and ever-growing cost of living, as well as to defend workers' rights. In Santiago, Chile, they marched with a banner that read, Rise the Strength of the Working People. In France, workers and leftists took to the streets to oppose the neoliberal agenda of the newly elected Emmanuel Macron. And in Quito, Ecuador, workers protested against the government of Guillermo Lasso for overseeing rising unemployment and a collapse in living conditions. Elsewhere, protesters and police clashed following violent clampdowns. In Istanbul, when workers tried to protest economic hardship caused by raging inflation, the police violently suppressed them. And in Montreal, Canada, protesters and police clashed during demonstrations demanding a higher minimum wage and better working conditions. And finally, the revolutionary May Day in Berlin, Germany, ended in scenes of violence as police detained several leftist protesters. At Navarra, we'll continue to cover workplace struggles and protests in what's set to be a year of dramatic labour unrest. Today, though, I want to take advantage of having a historian for a co-host and ask Barnaby why we have May Day in the first place and why it's on the 1st of May. Well, it began the May Day tradition we know, Workers' Day, in the United States, which may be slightly surprising. That country which was regarded by the late 20th century as a kind of backwater for socialist politics uh, was in the late 19th century seen as an advance guard for socialist politics. Marx moved, wanted to move the headquarters of the First International there. Um, and following the Paris Commune in 1871, when workers took control of a city, stormed heaven in the phrase of the time, uh, and ran it uh, until they were massacred, lined up against a wall and massacred. In a moment, that, that scene of workers running a city that sent waves of inspiration and terror in equal measure around the different classes of Europe and the world, well, the Paris Commune rippled out and was felt in America too. And by the 1870s, the great unrest in the United States uh, involved a railway strike in West Virginia, for example, in 1877, that was talked about in the press as a potential Paris Commune, a moment of workers, this terror that gripped bourgeois American society, workers taking power, running the world, not just demanding higher wages, but running the, their societies. Well, in Chicago, uh, in 1886, the events transpired that came to be the beginning of May Day. American labor organizations had called for a stoppage for people to stop working on the 1st of May to demand eight hours work, eight hours rest, and eight hours for what we will. That demand of the American labor movement and of the global labor movement for a limit to the amount of our time that capital could take from us for its profits. Um, and so 30,000 people went on strike in Chicago, the epicenter of industrial organizing in America. About 80,000 people demonstrated. and um, the police opened fire when those demonstrators on the 1st of May uh, um, uh, tried to stop scabs, uh, tried to stop workers from, from breaking the strike and, and, and crossing the picket line. And so a few days later, workers gathered to remember the two people killed by the police opening fire in a kind of act of memorial. And a bomb went off. This was a febrile time in the late 19th century. A bomb went off seven police later. I think eight police in total were killed and uh, four workers were killed by the, by the police attacking the crowd. And it's the events that transpired after that bomb went off in the so-called Haymarket riot that came to be sacralized, become sort of a sacred memory for the emerging labor movement. Eight men were tried, uh, leading anarchists. Uh, four men were hanged. None of those people was the bomber. Only two were even present when the bomb was thrown in Haymarket Square in that riot in uh, 1886. Um, uh, those two men were giving speeches and, and, and dispersed peacefully. Um, 
over a thousand potential jurors uh, were screened because any working person who expressed any sympathy with labor and socialist ideas was ruled out of the jury. So you had a trial where the jurors and the judge were openly hateful towards uh, the rising working class movement. And um, in the backlash that followed that trial and that, that, that bombing, um, the 10 hour working day became the norm again. Bosses counterattacked and, and, and ensured that workers could work longer. And a wave of hostility developed against this great specter, this great threat of the scum of society, as it was imagined, the people who kept society afloat, workers, and above all, migrant workers. Um, uh, six of the eight people tried in, in, after the Haymarket affair were of German descent. Um, and so much of the radical politics had been brought to America by German immigrants. Well, shortly afterwards, May Day was declared in France in 1889 as a kind of global uh, day. And so you can see in that history of International Workers' Day, mourning and melancholy and radicalism all tied together. The idea of revolution as an avenging of our dead, not just a promise of a new world, but uh, our revenge, as, as an Irish revolutionary once put it, will be the laughter of our children. The idea that we will carry forward the, the corpses of those killed by a very, very violent and brutal society, and in their memory, make a new world. In 1908, Michael, one last thing I'll say. In 1908, there was a gathering of Jewish socialists in the Russian Empire, the Bund, who called for a strike for the 1st of May. 1908 is a very bitter moment after a failed revolution in Russia in 1905, which had unleashed in that post-revolutionary tragedy uh, both a wave of anti-worker sentiment and laws and also vicious pogroms against Jews. So Jewish workers kind of doubly targeted. And the Bund gathered to honor Workers' Day and to issue a manifesto. And they said, comrades, the 1st of May is the bridge between ourselves and the future. It is the mighty cable which connects us with the international proletariat. Let us meet the great holiday, not with the dangerous indifference of the defeated, but with the joy of the victory of tomorrow. And that refusal of despair, I find particularly extraordinary as a hopeful message carried forward in May Day in difficult times. And the, the date's curious, isn't it? Because what we're doing is we're commemorating a, a riot and an act of repression that happened in the United States. But the United States is one of the only countries that doesn't celebrate Labor Day on May Day. They moved theirs to September. So why is the country where the sort of origin story took place? Why, do they, why have they chosen a different date? What's going on there? Ah, well, in a deliberate attempt to ensure that the international class spirit of May Day uh, is forgotten. In America, they celebrate a Labor Day on the, in early September. Um, it's a common thing for states to try to co-opt or abolish uh, May Day. Uh, the Nazis tried to replace it with a day honoring the uh, noble sacrifice of workers working hard for capitalist profits, because the original spirit of May Day is something very frightening. It's frightening because it's about a refusal of that most fundamental capitalist spirit, which is labor itself, the compulsion to work for a wage. Um, why is it celebrated on the 1st of May? It's not a coincidence, the timing. It's, it's three days before my birthday, which I think is the main reason. But also, and less importantly, it, it follows a medieval and early modern tradition of celebrating the start of summer and celebrating it with riotous festivals in which people stop doing any work and, and, and see the possibility of the kind of the world turned upside down, a day in which everyone comes together and just parties and plays. Um, uh, Puritans in the early United States uh, clamped down on May Day celebrations uh, in, in what's sometimes been regarded as a kind of attack on a pagan festival. But Peter Linneber, the great radical historian, says really it's because in May Day celebrations, settlers and indigenous people partied and celebrated celebrated together, and, and, and the Puritan radicals couldn't have any of that. It's all about leisure and play beyond the compulsion to work. And that's why it's central demand on the 1st of May, seized by labor movements, taking that popular festival and making it theirs, was for an eight-hour working day. It's often forgotten in the 20th century when the demand becomes full employment, that uh, the demand of the labor movement in times past, and it's now returning to us, I think, thankfully, uh, it is not just for decent employment, but also to minimize the amount of time that we spend chained to our workplaces. I'm all for that, Barnaby. I'm all for that. Um, not that I feel chained to my workplace, I have to say. I'm very, I'm very lucky in my job. Um, Barnaby, talk to us about some more recent May Days. That's the origins. How did it develop? Any sort of significant moments you can talk about? So many. Um, 
all over the world. I mean, it was on the 1st of May 1923 that the red flag was first raised in India, that country which gave us just last year the biggest general strike in world history. Then in 1945, uh, over the Reichstag uh, and the ruins of Nazi-occupied Berlin, uh, or Nazi Berlin, uh, uh, taken in the, in the end of the First World War, in the end of the Second World War, it, it was on the 1st of May 1945 that the red flag, which had been raised in India uh, and raised in Russia, now flew over Berlin in a sign of the defeat of Nazism, uh, including uh, by the extraordinary uh, bravery of the Soviet people. Um, Gustav Schaefer uh, was a Munich-based trade unionist who was grabbed by the Nazis, tortured and sent to Dachau concentration camp um, in raids on free trade unions that followed May Day after Hitler came to power. And Schaefer said, we bore witness and still bear witness today, he said, after the war was over, for human dignity and justice. That idea of bearing witness as crucial to May Day, even if you've lost the uh, optimism about total victory uh, that once guided late 19th century May Days, you can still bear witness to the horrors of the world. And then in 1975, it was at the end of April, the start of May, that the tanks rolled into Saigon in Vietnam and signaled on, the, on May Day 1975, the end of the American attempt to subjugate the people of Vietnam with imperial control so that anti-colonial struggles were joined to workers' struggles by a common aspiration, which was to live a life without masters, without the alienation of our powers to bosses and all the ferocity of imperial states. Those struggles against patriarchal control, International Women's Day was the spark for the Russian Revolution uh, in 1917, against imperial control, uh, which you see in, in, in that tank uh, 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 driving through Vietnam, uh, and against capitalist control. All of these struggles are fused as struggles for human freedom against domination, hierarchy and oppression. Ahead of the local elections, Labour have released a campaign video which features a very familiar face. Here's what a Labour government can do for the people of Britain if it wins power. Before 1997, Britain had no minimum wage. For a hundred years, people campaigned for one, we delivered it. Millions of pensioners and children were lifted out of acute poverty. School results increased dramatically across the board. Crime was cut by a third. NHS waiting lists slashed so that by the time we left office, NHS satisfaction levels were the highest they'd ever been since the NHS was created. We combined economic growth with social justice so the business prospered and we had the resources to build new schools and new hospitals. Unemployment was low, employment high. We changed our country to make it more tolerant and more equal. Before 1997, gay people faced discrimination. No one black had ever served in a British cabinet. No Muslims in the House of Lords. Women in Parliament made up less than 10% of the members of Parliament. All of that changed, and changed to last, so that even Conservatives had to support the change. Peace was brought to Northern Ireland after decades of conflict. The Olympics was brought to London, a symbol of a new and different country at ease with itself. Britain became a world leader in aid and development. In these huge ways, and in a myriad of small ways, Britain was changed for the better. Because we cared enough to be disciplined enough to win. Because we finally understood that when we lose, the British people lose. Today, after four defeats, just as in 1997, we have new leadership and a renewed sense of purpose and mission. Keir Starmer has shown strength, determination, and intelligence in setting Labour back on a winning path. He knows a Labour Party true to its principles is a Labour Party dedicated to winning power, to change our country again for the better. My, my, my. Barnaby, does that video with that phenomenal music in the background, does that make you inspired to go out and vote Labour this Thursday? It will fail to inspire me, that video, which won't surprise you, Michael, but just who will it inspire? I mean, Blair talked about the importance of winning power. So what does the polling show? It shows 19% of people like him and 55% of people actively dislike him. So there's something very interesting going on here. The cry for electability, uh, for uh, speaking to the country, not just our narrow party base, 
is really nothing of the sort. It's a kind of 1990s dogma that believes that moderation means winning elections with no account at all of the particular conditions of peace and prosperity in which that strategy worked, nor many answers for a world of inflation, falling living standards, climate and resource crises, and inter-imperialist conflict in which technocratic tinkering won't cut it, can't offer any answers. So I think it's very telling when people, and this happens across the left-right spectrum, right? When people live in the past because facing the present is just too difficult. Focus on the good old days, as Brecht famously put it, because we don't want to live in the bad new ones. It's really tragic how out of touch these people are with the scale of our challenges today. And their only hope is to win elections by default because the other lot are even more inept. But the important point here is that New Labour sowed the seeds of so many of our present miseries. This is a group of advisors around Keir Starmer who worship and adore the West Wing and and Alistair Campbell and Peter Mandelson, who were slightly more competent centrist managers than they are. Uh, and so they want to give Tony Blair a free slot to uh, rewrite his record. Well, the truth is, very interestingly published uh, a couple of days ago by the Daily Telegraph, that right-wing newspaper, which had an article attacking New Labour, but praised New Labour on a few things. They said New Labour managed to hollow out the welfare state more efficiently than Thatcher and Major had managed. New Labour managed to take apart the architecture of the National Health Service with PFI, private financial initiative, public-private fi uh, partnerships. Um, people should read Alison Pollock's amazing work, NHS PLC. Uh, and New Labour, of course, took apart comprehensive education with academization. Um, the uh, initial benefit cuts for single mums was one of the first things uh, that, that, that New Labour uh, pushed uh, in office to keep to Tory spending plans. And they did a kind of stealth redistribution through cash transfers like tax credits, which were very easily undone by a Tory government after 2010. They didn't change the structural uh, makeup of a deindustrialized country um, uh, with, uh, with the City of London responsible for all our prosperity, which, made, which meant Britain uh, was especially hard hit by the 2008 financial crisis. Other countries which were less reliant on private uh, um, finance were less hard hit. Gordon Brown had, had celebrated the end of boom and bust in the city as answering all our problems. Meanwhile, New Labour ramped up authoritarianism, which we now see uh, on steroids from a Tory government with CCTV, ID cards, 90-day detention without trial was one proposal, all targeted especially against Muslims who became a kind of fifth column enemy within uh, as part of the war on terror. Meanwhile, asylum seekers were battered and attacked to please the right-wing press. Refugees were pushed, a parliamentary select committee said, deliberately into destitution. That's the words of a parliamentary select committee when Tony Blair took away asylum seekers' right to work while they were seeking asylum. People fleeing some of the worst horrors in the world. Attacks on lefty lawyers from David Blunkett, uh, a new Labour Home Secretary, uh, trying to defend refugees. And the white working class, so-called, wasn't safe either. They were castigated as chabs in those new Labour years and targeted with ASBO's antisocial behaviour orders. Blair uh, publicly mused cutting housing benefit from, from parents whose kids, he said, were misbehaving, potentially, again, pushing people into destitution. But the last thing to say here is that right now, our politicians are united in their condemnation of Vladimir Putin. And some of them are saying, as I think, that he should be brought before an international uh, tribunal, he should be brought before The Hague for war crimes. Vladimir Putin is guilty now of violating the sovereignty of an independent country, ignoring the UN Security Council, uh, and so breaking international law. Anyone who says that can't be taken seriously if they have a video with someone who was also guilty of violating the sovereignty of an independent country, breaking international law, and killing up to a million people in Iraq. Tony Blair's a war criminal. He's responsible for so many of the damaging things of our contemporary politics, the drive towards authoritarianism, the attacks on racialized minorities, um, the uh, attacks on working class populations that gave us the, the Brexit vote. Um, he's responsible for so many damages, including hollowing out the welfare state and privatizing the NHS. But he's also a war criminal. And for that, he should really never be forgiven. Those are definitely the most significant reasons why Keir Starmer should not be trotting out Tony Blair because of all those policy failures. And, you know, the Iraq war is obviously a lot more than a policy failure. It's a war crime. But the problem with it as well is that it makes Keir Starmer look a bit shifty. Yes, the Blair endorsement came up in Keir Starmer's Sunday interview on Sky. Let's take a look. I can't imagine you putting a, a, an endorsement video for Jeremy Corbyn up. You, you took the whip off him. What I've why, said... Why, why didn't you say at the time? Why weren't you honest to say, yeah, actually, I am more close to Tony Blair? What I said at the time, what I've said consistently is, um, the team now that we've got, or the leadership team you that we've got... You would answer the question no, now, no, wouldn't you? Are you closer to Tony Blair or Jeremy Corbyn? Let me just tell you what I said at the time, which was, I'm not going to hug any previous Labour leader because I don't believe that you go backwards to go forward. I will learn from any Labour leader. I will talk with any Labour leader. And if it's Tony Blair who's won three elections, Gordon Brown who won it with them, then I'll happily take their advice and talk with them. Talk but to I've Tony never, Corbyn? But I've never suggested well, that we... Go, I think Tony actually, in that endorsement or something he said yesterday, said we're not 
put in the in the 1990s, we're actually got to face the future going forward. So it's the principles and approach that matter. But I, I you know. I spend my time talking to people who win because I want to win. I want to win because I want to change the lives of millions of people across the UK for the better. You didn't, say, you didn't tell me that in the leadership election, though, did you? I've, I think in the leadership election, I can't remember how many times the leadership election, um, I said, I think I used this phrase, saying, I'm not going to have the name of some previous Labour leader tattooed on my forehead. I have to take this party forward facing the challenge that we've got now. Okay. I can't, I'm not facing the challenges that Tony Blair faced a quarter of a century ago. Um, I'm not facing the challenge that previous leaders faced. I'm facing the challenges of tomorrow. And I'm absolutely determined okay. to not only change the Labour Party, but to change Britain in the work that we're doing. So he was so proud of that statement about not tattooing former leaders on his forehead that he's repeating it two years later. Very, very bizarre. Um, in any case, that was Keir Starmer saying Labour needs to look forward, not backward. He didn't really explain what that would mean. Luckily for him, though, it's not just Labour who are out of new ideas. The Tories have also gone retro. This is from The Telegraph. Boris Johnson wants to give millions of people the right to buy the homes they rent from housing associations in a major shake-up inspired by Margaret Thatcher. The Prime Minister ordered officials to develop the plans in the last fortnight after becoming convinced the idea would help, quote, generation rent, the Telegraph can reveal. The proposal is intended to give the 2.5 million households in England who rent properties from housing associations the power to purchase their homes at a discounted price. It would be a new version of the famous Thatcher scheme that allowed families to buy properties from councils, one of the most well-known policies of her premiership. The Telegrapher right, right to buy was one of Thatcher's most well-known policies. It also had some of the worst long-term effects. Four in every 10 homes which were sold by councils to tenants are now owned by private landlords. So we have exactly the same product as when the homes were owned by local authorities, except now wet rents are way more expensive and the cash flows to the wealthy instead of to, to the state. Barnaby, is the only thing worse than borrowing from Blair, borrowing from Thatcher? Well, I think Thatcher, unlike Blair, was a kind of genius. Um, and Right to Buy is one of the purest examples of that. It's the best example I know in modern British politics of what Antonio Gramsci, the, the, the great Italian Marxist, called a hegemonic strategy. It remakes the class map uh, in your interests as the Tory party. Here's what it does, Right to Buy. It takes two problems of post-war Britain. Firstly, a large working class that includes people who clean schools and people who are head teachers in those schools, all of whom live next to each other in council housing uh, and are therefore reliant on the state and, and, and are more likely to vote Labour and to identify with each other. And also the organisation of urban space, where large sections of inner cities, especially London, that key site of capital accumulation is given over to working class housing. And these are two problems which if you're going to redesign a neoliberal country, you want to avoid. So what do you do? Well, you don't just attack people and seize their housing from them and, and make them hate you. No, you do a right to buy policy, which says if you can put down a deposit, you can buy your home, sell it for much more, move out to the suburbs, become a suburban property owner, no longer a council tenant. And at the same time, Thatcher's privatizing industries as a tell Sid campaign on TV, you can buy shares in private industries that you used to own because everyone owned them when they were publicly owned. Um, and you've moved then a section of what was the working class from being council house tenants to being uh, property owning shareholders checking the stock prices in the Financial Times, while, and you've split them from that lower section of the working class, the people who can't afford the deposits, uh, remain in council housing, and then you can attack those people um, just as you've got a geographically and a racially differentiated attack where you're attacking black people in the cities, miners in the north. Um, so you've split up the class map and, and, and won a section of what was the working class uh, to your side, while also changing space the organization of space, because you've taken places like inner London, which were given over to large amounts of working class housing. And uh, when the council tenants all realize they can make a lot of money by setting up in those spaces, you've cleared up the, uh, the space for private redevelopment for offices and private homes. So it's a genius kind of policy, which I think the left should study uh, as an example of a, of a hegemonic strategy. It's a really uh, clever and, and, and dastardly thing that Thatcher did. Its effects 
long term, as with so much that she did, like the quick spending of North Sea oil revenue, were of course extremely damaging. We have a, a tiny and shrinking housing stock, partly because Thatcher put no obligation on councils to use the money they got from council house sales to, to build more. So it's, it's very damaging, especially for working class people who need council housing. And most of us are now stuck in a private rented market with soaring rents that we can barely afford to pay. It didn't do any of us any good, but it won Thatcher some election victories and it remade the British class map in her interests. I think she banned councils from reinvesting it in, in council homes. I think that was one of the most sort of out, outrageous parts of it. This as well, actually going back to that new Labour discussion, I think on a domestic front, this is clearly their most obvious failure, right? And I always say this stat because I'm a little bit obsessed with it, but in my home borough, 1997, houses costed, cost an average of three times um, someone's income. They now cost an average of 15 times someone's income. Now, most of that was under new Labour. New Labour massively oversaw the transition of our society from one based on production to one based on speculation and assets. Obviously, you know, it was Thatcher who was the trailblazer, as you say, Barnaby, she was the genius, but Blair followed that path and we live in that world today, unfortunately. A flurry of reactionary bills have just become law. And ahead of the local elections on Thursday, here are three ways the Tories have made Britain a more dangerous and less free place. At the top of the list is Priti Patel's Nationality and Borders Act. It's her attempt to take Britain's hostile environment and just ramp it up a notch. So what are the key points? Well, the Act introduces a new criminal offence for arriving in the UK without entry clearance. It introduces a two-tier asylum system, meaning those who arrive in the UK by irregular means may receive less protection and support. And it reduces the threshold at which someone is considered to have committed a particularly serious crime and therefore may not receive refugee protection. These are all policies to try and make our asylum system even harsher than it already is. And the most contentious element is that first one. That's because it's contrary to international law to criminalise asylum seekers based on the means by which they arrive in a country. People have a right to seek asylum wherever they choose, regardless of how they get there. And by creating this new category of illegal asylum seekers, the government has given itself an excuse to shirk responsibility for people fleeing persecution. That's because for most people, it's impossible to arrive in the UK except by irregular means. If you are an Iraqi, Sudanese, Iranian or Eritrean, the only way to claim asylum is to come to the UK. But if you do that, you will have broken the law and weakened your claim for asylum. It's a grim catch 22. But it gets worse. Because if an asylum seeker does come to Britain via an irregular route, which I repeat is for most people the only possible way to claim asylum here, they could find themselves with a one-way ticket to Rwanda. Yes, the government are planning to ship asylum seekers fleeing persecution 4,000 miles to Rwanda. This has been described as offshore processing. But the word processing here is a misnomer. If you get ship, shipped to Rwanda and your asylum claim is accepted, you'll be given asylum to stay in Rwanda. Under no circumstances will you be able to come back to the UK. Other key parts of the Act make it harder to successfully claim asylum regardless of how you arrive in the UK. That's because it increases the burden of proof required and shortens the time that an asylum seeker has to show their evidence. And given there aren't many people fleeing war or persecution with reams of documents, this is just another transparent attempt to make our asylum system less humane. The Nationality and Borders Act was at the top of Priti Patel's agenda as home secretary. But this isn't the only sinister triumph she's had this year. That's because she's managed to get another set of laws through Parliament, the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Act. The main aim of this law is to put a stop to the kind of recent protests that have been effective at holding the government to account on issues such as climate change and racism. But it will also have serious effects on Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities. Here are the key changes. So the Act bans pro protests that cause, quote, serious disruption, increases the criminal penalties for breaking police conditions on protests, and makes trespass a criminal offence. Under laws contained in the Act, police have been given new powers to shut down protests that cause, as I say, quote, serious disruption. And what counts as serious disruption is decided by Priti Patel, by the Home Secretary. 
And it could mean anything from being too noisy to involving too many people. And if people don't acquiesce to police instructions to end the protest, they now face fines and criminal convictions. And it even applies to just a single person. Hold a placard and yell through a megaphone. And if you refuse to follow police directions about how to conduct your protest, you could be fined two and a half thousand pounds. The law also targets specific actions with lengthy prison sentences. The law means you can be jailed for up to 10 years for creating a public nuisance. And if you obstruct a motorway or an A road, you can get one year inside. Notably, the law also states that damage to memorials could lead to up to 10 years in prison, which could have applied to those who toppled the statue of slave trader Edward Colston in Bristol. The law also asserts, and this is really sinister, that you can be guilty of not following police conditions on a protest, even if you didn't know they existed. Up to now, the police have to show that they told you before you didn't follow their instructions. Finally, by criminalising trespass, the Act makes it illegal for nomadic gypsy, Roma and traveller communities to practice their traditional way of life. Nomadic GRT folk who move from place to place, stopping overnight or for a few days at a time, now run the risk of jail and a £3,000 fine if they stop on someone else's property. Worse, they can have their vehicle, so their caravan or camper van, compounded, leaving them homeless, which could risk their children being taken into care. The bill instead requires gypsies, roma and travellers to settle on legal council-provided pitches. But, and here's the clincher, the Tories have already removed the obligation for councils to provide approved pitching sites. Many have since sold them off, and research in 2021 found that 1,696 families were on a waiting list for one of the few precious pitches available in the country. Finally, let's talk about the Elections Act. This has been spearheaded by Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch, and the government says the point of the Act is to stop electoral fraud. These are the key elements. It requires voters to provide specific forms of photographic evidence at polling stations, increases government control of the Electoral Commission, and removes the 15-year limit on voters living overseas. It used to be the case that if you wanted to vote, you put yourself on the electoral roll and then simply turned up at your polling station on the day. Not any more. Under the Elections Act, you will have to provide photographic evidence identifying yourself. These include passports and driving licences, but older people can also use certain travel documents, like the older person's bus pass, the disabled person's bus pass, the Oyster 60 Plus card and the Freedom Pass. The Lords tried to amend the bill to include similar documents for younger people, national rail cards, for example, student ID cards and 18 plus student Oyster cards, but the government rejected all of them. And it's also known that ethnic minorities are less likely to return to a polling station if turned away, and that poorer people don't have photographic ID to the same degree that wealthier people do. In 2021, Channel 4 looked into the issue. This is something that's out there, that one in four Black and Asian people are not even registered to vote. So why are you now putting an extra challenge for this community who already doesn't vote? It's it's just, it's, it's, it's unacceptable. Channel 4 News commissioned a special ethnic minority poll to get a glimpse into how these reforms could affect voter behavior. We asked a crucial question. How likely would you be to return to the polling booth if you turned up to vote without the correct ID? Across all ethnic minorities, at least one in four said they were certain or unlikely to return. For the mixed group, that's higher at 34%. And for ethnic minorities who say they don't vote or they rarely vote, the number was even higher. 44% of people said they were unlikely to return. 13% of people in council housing, 11% of the unemployed and 8% of disabled people don't currently have the correct ID. As if that's not bad enough, the government has also helped itself to new powers to determine how elections are run. Until the law came in, the Electoral Commission was a wholly independent body charged with overseeing elections and prosecuting parties or individuals who broke their regulations. Not anymore. Now the Electoral Commission must abide by a strategy and policy statement drawn up by the government that tells the Commission what its work and priorities should be. When the bill was first put forward, the Electoral Commission said this. 
The introduction of a strategy and policy statement which enables the government to set the strategic direction for the work of the commission is not consistent with the role that an independent commission plays in a healthy democracy. This independence is fundamental to maintaining confidence in our electoral system. The provisions in the bill would give current or future UK governments the power to direct our work and may lead the public and campaigners to believe there had been political interference in the way we operate. This could affect the way we work to ensure parties and campaigners are following the political finance laws. It could also affect the advice and guidance we provide to electoral administrators, parties and campaigners and the UK's parliament. Now, the government ignored this risk, evidently. Why, though? Most likely because they don't see it as a bug, but a feature. Finally, the new Act changes the limit on how long you can live overseas while still being allowed to vote. Previously, if you lived abroad for 15 years or longer, you could no longer vote in UK elections. But now you can live overseas forever and still get a vote. And perhaps most importantly for the Tories, you can continue to donate to political parties, like this man did in 2019. John Gore is a theatre impresario who lives in the Bahamas. In 2019, the billionaire was the Tory party's largest donor, handing over £1 million in the weeks before the election. That brought his total donation to the party to £4.8 million since 2017. The Election Act, evidently, lets more people like Mr Gore donate more money to the Tory party party for longer, while making it harder for people who might not vote for the Tory party to vote. Barnaby, we've got three appalling laws um, there to talk about. What stands out to you most? Well, the party of the small state, so-called, in fact, uses the state aggressively that I think is the lesson here, to fight class conflicts. And it shrinks only the state's softer redistributive arms. They disempower their opposition with an election meddling bill and an anti-protest law. And then they turn to the question, how to generate popular support for the status quo while people face deep crises as their living standards plummet. And horribly, their answer is to direct as much popular rage as they can against the most vulnerable. So they say, okay, let's assault and harass travelers until their lives become unlivable, maybe there's a few votes in that. They cleanse the country of refugees so that the same politicians who vote to bomb faraway lands and then sometimes profit by investing in soaring arms stocks, weapons stocks, hope to keep their jobs by ensuring the people fleeing their bombs cannot reach safety. Uh, they hope their constituents will vote for them after they've pocketed some money and bomb people far away by keeping away desperate refugees. I mean, just imagine yourself in this position. Your home's destroyed, your life goes up in flames, you run into the sea because there seems to be no other option. And then Britain sends you to a land, Rwanda, which until five minutes ago, the British government itself said does not respect human rights, a country where refugees were shot by the police for protesting against cuts to their food rations. Nobody is safe from this political logic, which attacks one vulnerable group after another. LGBT people were once thought accepted and, and, and safe in British society when I was growing up under New Labour. Now we see renewed attacks on trans people. Just this week, it was revealed that children are being surveilled by Home Office employees still positioned in local councils to spy on family services in order to stop immigrants using them and possibly to deport immigrants. Uh, that's the no recourse to public funds policy. So think what that means. Kids facing abuse are told not to seek help or the state will put people into councils to chase them down and punish them. It's really, really sickening. And we face 10 years now of social sadism targeting one group after another. You might think you're safe from this if you're white. But remember, in the early Cameron Osborne years, the attacks, uh, the, the vicious kind of moral panic attacks on anyone claiming any kinds of benefits, even though uh, lots of people claiming benefits are in work, um, but they were called lazy and work shy, um, uh, while, while bankers uh, profited enormously. You might think if you're in a stable job, then you're safe from these kind of uh, nasty attacks. But remember, in those early Cameron Osborne years, the attacks on public sector workers with their gold-plated uh, uh, pensions. Um, the politics of moral panics and setting victims against each other only benefits a tiny ruling class. And the worrying thing here is the fusion of that politics of moral panic in an attempt to gain support for a Tory party which doesn't have answers to the desperate crises of our moment 
the fusion of those moral panics against one group after another, Roma people, migrants, uh, uh, with an authoritarianism that seeks to clamp down on opposition, to use the state aggressively uh, in the name uh, of a politics that claims to be all about libertarianism and a small state. It's very worrying times. It's also just incredibly transparent. I mean, on on loads of levels. I mean, obviously, they're trying to sort of do a populist appeal to what they think is a reactionary base. But especially when it comes to the police and crime bill, it's so obvious that what they are doing is to try and make sure that the quite successful movements, which we've seen over the past few years, can't happen again. What have been the most successful protests over the past few years that really transformed the public debate and had an effect on policy? It was Black Lives Matter in the summer of 2020 and the pulling down of the, the, the Colston statue, which... You know, I, th I think if you poll the public, everyone said, oh, I, I like the cause, but I don't like how they did it. But people who were brought onto a jury, you know, to, to think about this seriously, they found those people innocent of criminal damage because essentially they recognized that pulling that statue down was the right thing to do. You know, what the Tories will say is, oh, yeah, of course, there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to bring down a statue of a slave trader, but you should do it by the proper means. The reason they pulled that down is because it was impossible to bring it down by the proper means, because there was, I mean, there's some sort of shady um, organizations that were associated with sort of the, the memory of this, this guy. But obviously, once they pulled it down, then that completely transformed the politics of all of this. Colston Hall was renamed, there were schools which were renamed. This idea that it was acceptable to have large parts of Bristol, a city with a large black population, named after a slave trader, that was transformed overnight because of that very, very effective piece of direct action. And it's just not the case that if we threaten people with, with 10 years for pulling down a statue, oh, people will find other means to take that down. Because the history of the Colston statue in Bristol shows that people had tried all the means. People had tried all the legitimate means, all the lawful means. They resorted to that and they resorted to that and it worked. And, you know, as I say, if you poll people to say, oh, I don't like that it was brought down, but they all agree with the cause, you know, so... This action works. Sometimes you need to do it. Extinction Rebellion, exactly the same. If you look at polling on how much people cared about climate change, the moment those Extinction Rebellion, that, that first wave happened when they were sort of occupying those bridges, the number of people who put climate change as one of their top three concerns rocketed. It was unprecedented. And that had real practical impacts. Parliament declared a climate emergency. They would not have done that without people causing unrest causing a public nuisance in the middle of London. And I, you know, I, I understand how people, they're trying to get their bus to work. They're kind of annoyed, potentially, that the bridge is being blocked. But if we make all of these things illegal, then how are these changes going to happen? Because as I say, if, if they hadn't pulled down that statue, it would have been there for another, well, who knows? It could have been there for another century. I mean, th they had been trying to bring it down by the legitimate means. It didn't work. And now what this law does is essentially means that there are fewer and fewer ways for people to fight for justice and to, to get rid of offensive statues and change catastrophic policies such as Britain's relationship to fossil fuels at the moment. Um, Barnaby, how do you think this will affect protests? I mean, on one level, the Extinction Rebellion argument was always, we want to go to prison because it's only by going to prison that we show how serious this issue is. Do you think they will sort of continue despite the laws and just Know, take the punishment or do you think this really will scare people away from from going out and and taking part in disruptive protests well it's very important that we don't do the government's work for it by scaremongering about the law uh, in a way that puts people off the streets so it's not the case that a law has been passed which bans all protest and which means that no one should ever protest again and that there was there's been some concern from various organizers in different campaigns about presentations of the law like that but one of the things that governments do when they pass laws is trump them up uh, in, with, a, with a grand rhetoric uh, that, that exaggerates uh, what they're doing and, and so hopes to put people off protesting. I don't think it will put people off protesting, but it will uh, ensure that lots of uh, direct action uh, and even just noisy and, and troublesome protests. Uh, people on picket lines, for example, trying to, uh, uh, lots of trade unions in recent years have, have, have uh, Sharon Gray and the General Secretary of Unite has pioneered a strategy of uh, targeted, um, uh, loud, active, um, uh, colorful protest against bad employers, for example. And so all of those possibilities are gonna be narrowed. And when uh, organizations like trade unions or big NGOs are thinking of calling protests, they'll have to consult lots of lawyers about what they 
can and can't do. Uh, and their ability to act freely uh, will be, will be uh, chilled. And individuals who are not part of those big groups who don't know about these things, uh, who go out and protest, can then be taken out of action with big fines uh, that stop them uh, 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 from being able to protest again. Um, and so I think it's, it's worrying. It's, it's not the case that all protest is going to be impossible now, uh, but it is part of a government that claims to love liberty and hate the big oppressive state. Boris Johnson likes to talk about how the Labour Party is the party of oppressive state power. In fact, yet again, as has always been the case, the ruling class uses the state to fight its wars and is prepared to, and that means abroad, uh, and it also means at home against the oppressed and exploited, uh, and they're doing it now. Mm, I think my, I'm not a legal expert, but my understanding of this law is that it might actually take a while for us to understand its significance, because one of the things it does is just introduces a lot of discretionary power. So introduces discretionary power for the police and for the Home Secretary to define when something is a public nuisance. So I think the, you know, the law does give the police and the Home Secretary the kind of powers that really could, you know, ban a very, very wide range of protests, but we don't know how it's going to be enforced. And, you know, as Barnaby says, it's it's not that protests are banned, but essentially the government now has a lot more power to ban protests than it did previously. And these are, these are rights which we've had for centuries. Like, it is a pretty big deal, especially that trespass one. I always remember when I was sort of in my more anarcho days, it was... You know, people always talk, you know, trespass is not illegal. It's never been illegal in Britain. It, that, I always thought of that as sort of this foundational um, thing about sort of British liberalism. Just gone, you know, just gone. It's illegal now. You can't do it anymore. And it is, they've passed this so easily. You know, I, I thought lots of these were sort of ancient rights that actually it would be kind of hard to take away, but they've just written them all down. Oh, actually the Home Secretary can decide if this is illegal. The Home Secretary can decide if that's illegal. And that's now the law. Um, Barnaby, let's end on a note of not being depressed. Um, so these three very terrible laws have been passed. Not only do they have, you know, immediate terrible consequences, large parts of them, I think, work to increase the power of the Conservative Party and help in their, their re-election um, the next time they need to stay in power and um, to so the next general election. How should people respond? How do we respond to terrible laws that have already passed? Well, one of the lessons, as you said, Michael, is that people need to clamp down on something when they're worried. And in the new Labour, the bitter, dark, sad new Labour years, um, where the left was confined, as Peter Mandelson put it, I think, to a sealed tomb, it was unimaginable that someone like Jeremy Corbyn would be leader of the Labour Party. And it was also unimaginable that large numbers of people would come out onto the streets, young people, to protest against climate change, to protest uh, in the demand that black lives matter across towns and cities all over Britain, some of the largest mobilizations in British history, perhaps since the Chartists in the 19th century. So the future is with us. And the reason that the Tories wage uh, uh, aggressive uh, legislation to clamp down on protest and also at the same time panic about their youth vote, for example, is because they know that in a world of rising prices uh, in which basic essentials like a home and energy become increasingly difficult to afford, a world of rising inter-imperialist tensions in which they want to marshal us behind various national chauvinisms while we face the same challenges all over the world. Um, they know that they don't have answers to give us decent, secure, dignified lives, lived in conditions of freedom, lived in conditions where we feel empowered. Um, they don't have those answers. Many of us feel that the answers are to be found elsewhere. And when we march for the planet, we're marching for a dignified life for everyone. When we march uh, against police violence and endemic violence against women or police violence and endemic violence against black people, when we march to defend migrants and say the enemy doesn't arrive by migrant dimmy, dinghy, the enemy arrives by limousine, the enemy arrives by private airplane, we know where the battle lines are drawn. We're ready for the fights ahead. They're fights against organized and entrenched wealth and power, and they're fights for everyone to live in conditions of freedom. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I should say, I'm, Ash is going to be back next Monday, so that's the good news. I'm so excited to have her as my co-host. But what that means is that Barnaby's stint um, for Monday Night Tisky Sours is coming to an end. But I will reassure you, because I know that you know, there'll be outrage in the comments if I don't reach We are going to find a way for you to see a lot more. How have you found your, your Monday Night stint? You've been doing it a couple of months now. 
It's been beautiful, Michael. I, I never imagined a career for myself as a, a news presenter, but with your steady hand and guiding reassurance, um, it's, been, uh, it's been a joy. I, I learn from Ash, who is the master at these things, so I'll, I'll be watching her when she's back on Monday, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much for stepping up like a duck to water. Um, we will wrap up there. Um, thank you so much for watching this evening. I hope you had a wonderful bank holiday Monday. Um, we'll be back on Wednesday at 7pm. You've been watching Tisky Sour. Good night.